why we're doing what we're doing up here in Augusta. And it starts with the Savannah Harbor expansion project down in Savannah. Um, we're, we're deepening the harbor down there and uh, according to our reports, deepening the harbor would increase the salinity in the river. And that reduces the spawning habitat for uh, a bunch of fish, but two of note which are endangered species, the short-nosed sturgeon and the Atlantic sturgeon. Um, there's no way to mitigate uh, for those species in the, in the harbor down in Savannah, and the law requires us to, to mitigate any time we impact an, an endangered species. When the Lock and Dam was constructed uh, back in 1937, it capped uh, the species from reaching their traditional spawning grounds, which is the Augusta Shoals, and all along the river up here, 19 miles upriver from the Lock and Dam. Um, so the only way to really mitigate for the species uh, from the deepening is to get them past the Lock and Dam. So back in uh, 2006, 2007, 2008, when, when we were building the reports for the Savannah Harbor Expansion Project, we had originally planned to uh, keep the uh, to leave the lock and dam structure the way it was and do a fish, fish passage that circumvented the structure, um, and that came out in the official report in 2014. In December of 2016, the Water Infrastructure Improvements for the Nation Act was passed, and that deauthorized the structure. Um, the re one of the reasons why it deauthorized the structure is because uh, it, the purpose for which it was created was to get barge commercial barge traffic upstream to Augusta, and the last barge to go through there was in 1979. The federal government took note of that, and by 1985, uh, the structure was put in caretaker status um, because it wasn't providing the benefit to the nation anymore that it had been. Um, when a structure like that goes in caretaker status, there's only a limited amount of, uh, of federal uh, appropriations to serve all the lock and dam structures across the nation. Um, and, and so when a structure goes in caretaker status, funding stops, um, or at least significantly curtails. And since that time in 1985, the, the structure has had three decades to dilapidate and start to fall apart. Um, so the Water Infrastructure and Improvements for the Nation Act recognized that and deauthorized the structure, but also recognized that the pool was important for, for people in Augusta. So it told us to do one of two different things. To, to either uh, repair the, just the lock wall, not the entire lock, but the lock wall, the new Savannah Bluff Lock and Dam, and modify the structure so fish could get past it, or uh, replace the structure with a water damming device, in that case it's a fixed weir, that would allow fish to get upstream, but also retain the pool for Augusta. Uh, so we spent the last year, year and a half, studying multiple different alternatives. It started with 30 and we got down to four alternatives, and we talked about those four back in June. Um, when we were considering. And then in November we, had, we came up and we had another public meeting and we identified the plan that we had t intended to recommend, um, which is the current plan that you have been seeing in the news and you read about, and we're calling that Alternative 2-6D. What that plan does is it, it gives us the highest weir that we can possibly get without causing flooding impacts. It also puts a, uh, uh, an excavated floodplain around the structure so that when we do get a lot of rain, it won't call it, water will have a way to get around the structure without causing flooding impacts in Augusta. Um, so I think that summarizes uh, the background and the history. And now I'll just go ahead and go over a little bit about what we're doing here today. Um, there's a team of us here today um, to uh, take a look at what's, how it looks up here with our own eyes and to do our own readings and take our depth readings and verify that our models uh, are saying what they said the conditions would be like. Um, and so what we're finding is, is we're seeing about exactly what we expected to see. Um, our models predicted there would be shallow areas, and in those areas they're shallow. And there's some areas that would be showing mud, and in those areas they're showing mud. And then in, other, in a lot of areas it's, it's deep and the channel is maintained, and our models uh, said it would be like that, and that's what we're seeing. Um, so what we're finding today is exactly what we expected to see. Um, and what you're seeing right now is the low end of average flow uh, right now if the rock weir were in place. Um, and that is roughly about 5,000 cubic feet per second of water flowing through this area. Um, that's the low end of average. The high end of average is 8,000, so roughly between six and seven and a half thousand cubic feet per second is what we typically see in the summer. The winter it's typically more than that just by virtue of the way that the weather cycle works. Um, so the last, the last thing I'll say before I open up for questions is uh, just to give you an idea of what's going to happen from now until August. Um, we're going to hold the, the pool levels like this uh, throughout the weekend and pro probably till next, uh, next week. And for those of you who are here, um, I'm, we're glad that you're out here because part of the reason why we're doing this is so you can see it, make an informed 
uh, have informed comments if you want to submit some comments. But for people who haven't had a chance to come out, we urge them to come out um, and not just to look um, at photos that are posted online and news reports. The river is big and um, the, the news is limited in time and scope to cover some of these areas. Um, so we really urge people to come out uh, and take a look at, uh, at the river for themselves so they can draw their own conclusions on what they see. Um, then we'll bring the water level back up on Wednesday. Um, and on March 6th, uh, that's the tentative date, we're gonna be having the public meeting that I talked about. Um, we had a venue. Um, it fell through. We're trying to get a, another venue for that date, um, and we expect to be able to do that. Um, but we'll be announcing that online on our social media, on our blog, and through the news uh, once we have a venue confirmed. Um, at that public meeting, um, we encourage everyone who has questions to come. Our team of engineers will be there. We'll have our planners there, and we'll have NOAA Fisheries there. Um, we'll, my commander for the Savannah District, Colonel Dan Hibner, will also be there. Um, and we'll be there to talk about the report. We'll give a, uh, an executive summary about what is in the report um, and then we'll have booths set up and we'll be there for a couple hours um, so that we can answer questions as best as possible and we'll also be taking written comments or comments by dic uh, dictation at that time. Um, after, after that the comment period will, is uh, scheduled to close uh, roughly 30 days after tomorrow so tomorrow is the 15th so mid-March the comment period will close. Um, then we'll compile all the comments and the National Environmental Policy Act requires us to address each of the comments and we intend to do that. Um, and then once we have all the comments addressed and discussed and, and if we need to make adjustments based on the comments we get, we'll make adjustments. Um, then we'll submit the final report to our headquarters in uh, Atlanta, the South Atlantic Division. And they are the decision authority and they will take a, time, take a few months to look at it and make their own judgments and decisions. And a, we do expect a final decision in August. After August, um, we're on a timeline to re that we're required to start construction of, uh, of whatever the final product will be by January 2021. Um, that is uh, part of a settlement agreement in the Savannah Harbor Expansion Project. And I think that covers about everything I wanted to say, so I'll go ahead and open up for questions from the media. Russell.